Welcome back. You're watching Stock Picks, and today we unpack logistics and energy and banking spaces with First Solar, Grandrod, and Standard Bank. Fahima Adia from uh, Momentum Securities joins us with her analysis on those counters. Fahima, always a pleasure and a good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Alessandra. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. First things first, is there anything these counters have in common? Uh, is there a theme here, or are these just counters that you're liking right now? So I think the common seed with uh, Grinrod and Standard Bank, of course, is that focus on Africa and the growth that we're expected to see coming from that market in the next few years. Um, on the first solar side, I think the main theme from that one, of course, is the, the drive to renewable energy, given uh, the global uh, drive to shift to renewable energy to reduce our carbon footprint. Brilliant. I actually want to start off uh, speaking about Standard Bank. They released a set of numbers just the other day, Fahima. I was super impressed. Can you get your thoughts on this one? Yeah, so I thought it was a, a pretty good set of uh, results, uh, not a thunder. So if we have a closer look at it, we saw the headline earnings grow 26%. Return on equity was healthy at about at over 18%. While the, the credit loss ratio was uh, higher. Uh, it was within their target range and close to the top. And that's understandable, you know, considering that uh, the SA consumer is under increased pressure due to the higher inflationary and interest rate environment. So it's similar to what we've seen um, from other banks, but definitely better than the credit loss ratio we recently saw come out of EPSA, which was actually above their target ratio. And what I really liked about the results was the fact that the Africa business in particular has been performing very well that contributed about 42% uh, to group headline earnings. Um, but the, the, the share price was a bit down after that uh, result, I'm sure you noticed. Uh, the main reason for that, though, is in terms of the outlook, uh, they are saying that they're expecting a bit uh, lower growth going forward. So if we look at net interest income, that's expected to grow, they say, in the low to mid single digits. Um, and then there's also some concerns about currency devaluations coming from Africa. But now, given the recent pullback in the share price, I do think it definitely offers value at current levels. And uh, it is one that we're expecting to see recovery in the long term, especially considering the, the pending interest rate cuts and low inflationary environments uh, that, that should come up. You know, I must ask you about uh, banking in South Africa, just also considering the fact that maybe Standard Bank uh, is a bank that uh, they decided to go into Africa with about 30 years ago. So uh, th that's been their strategy. But here at home, is the banking sector X growth? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult uh, question, a good one though, Nolatana, because the problem is if we look at our overall economic growth, it's just so low. And it's very difficult, uh, you know, for a bank that is very uh, tied to the economy to be seeing, you know, exponential growth and good growth if the economy in which it's it's operating in has such low levels of growth. So I do. Uh, that's why we're seeing a lot of banks trying to diversify in other places, like, for example, you know, Standard Bank looking for diversity of income in Africa, because, yes, locally and at home, it's, it's a very tough environment considering the very low levels of growth we're projecting for the country in the next year or two. And then also, uh, I must also uh, ask you about when we think of the rest of Africa here. We know that, for instance, APSA launching a very similar, uh, you know, uh, value proposition of the rest of the continent. Is Standard Bank too far gone? I think, I mean, 30 years of them investing in the strategy, it's finally starting to pay off. Uh, does anybody compete with Standard Bank at this point in servicing the continent? No, I definitely think they have a, a leading position because, like you said, they've been doing this over about 30 years now. And it's taken time for them to really build up that position. They're also looking to increase their footprint there. And uh, what I also noticed in their results uh, presentation that was quite good is that they've also got a leading position when it comes to the green energy space in Africa. So there's a lot of opportunity in the space, you know, given the, the transition to uh, renewable energy. And uh, they've got quite a strong pipeline with very aggressive targets. They, they're targeting about 250 billion rand in sustainable finance by 2026. So I, I don't really think other banks can compete uh, when it comes to yeah the, the, the Africa space. 
And before moving away from this one, lower interest rates, Fahima. Uh, we know, I think, net, net interest in Kamo, I think, was 25% uh, increase that they saw in that one. I think that's quite a number. But if we do see interest rates falling in the second half, which I think is what you're referring to with the outlook, can we just anticipate that that will not be, uh, you know, as a great for Sun Bank or any of the banks, really? Yeah, so the thing is with the high interest rate environment, the banks have been benefiting from that endowment effect. Uh, but I think when the interest rates fall, Nolatandu, it'll be a twofold impact, right? So on one hand, they won't benefit as much from the higher interest rates. But on the other hand, they will benefit because consumers will be under less pressure. And things like your credit loss ratio will come down as well. They'll be able to extend more loans. So it will have, um, I think overall, it will have a better impact on the bank in the long term once uh, consumers are just in a better financial position and are under less pressure. Brilliant. So I want to move on to Grinrod now. I always say that Grinrod is a business that's at the right place at the right time, uh, Fahima. Let's talk about uh, why you <laughs> like this counter. So I really like Grinrod uh, because, again, uh, of that Africa story, uh, it's it's really been benefiting from the growth in African trade, and we expect it to continue to do so in the next few years. It has a presence already in about 14 African countries. And if you look at the recent results, it was very strong, and they showed record volumes from that Maputo port. So, of course, you know, we've been having those challenges uh, with the Transnet ports in South Africa. So we've seen a lot of mining houses and other big companies now divert their uh, trade towards the Maputo port to try and alleviate that. And uh, recently, the, the government of Maputo also extended the concession that Grinrod and their, uh, their partner there has to run the ports until 2058. So that definitely gives them certainty uh, for the next few years. What we're, I think, also seeing with Grinrod, and I think it's really, really fascinating, is just how uh, effective uh, Triple P's can be here. And I'm wondering, Fahima, if South Africa is making use of this. Is this what we're trying to do there with our rails at this point, uh, you know, to on our ports, to see this kind of a uh, Triple P come together and really, really uh, not only boost a company like Grinrod, but be good for the whole ecosystem, the economy at large? Sorry, I, uh, the, you broke up. You Sorry, oh, yes, I was, I was asking about just the powerful Triple P, uh, the, the private-public partnership that we are seeing between the Maputo government and a company like Grinrod uh, and its other partner there. South Africa not quite there yet with this model. It's such a good point because uh, Grinrod's actually been making such good progress in these partnerships in other countries outside of South Africa, like, you know, for example, Maputo. We've even seen them make very good progress with the likes of Swaziland. Um, but unfortunately, when it comes to South Africa, uh, there are talks, you know, going on with Transnet to partner, partner with them on the freight rail side of things. But of course, it's, it's very slow. Um, and we're definitely not seeing the same progress that we're seeing with the other African countries. Uh, and it, it, it's a very good question. You know, we need to ask ourselves why. But uh, hopefully now, you know, Transnet has announced uh, that they are going to be more open to allowing the private sector to participate in the railway um, part of the business. And I can expect that Grinrod will probably participate and can somehow benefit from that too. What does growth for Grinrod look like, uh, Fahima? So, um, like I said, uh, because of this focus on Africa, and the, the, the ports business in Maputo that's been doing really well there. They want to keep uh, focusing on Africa, extending their presence there. So I think going forward, it will be quite strong. They also have that partnership with Maersk, which they entered into in, in the past few years. And that also helps in terms of providing an end-to-end -end solution for international clients. So they're quite strong on that side too. And um, like I said, you know, going forward, they could get involved in that rail uh, uh, Transnet partnership, which will be another leg of growth for the company. Um, they themselves have about 54 locos on their own railway business, which uh, Transnet could definitely make use of. And uh, yeah, all in all, I think uh, there's a lot more growth to come from this company, especially considering that, you know, they've really focused now on their core operations. They sold off a lot of their non-core operations in the past few years, like things like, you know, friendship, friend banking, and they're a lot more focused, I think, now and well positioned. Brilliant. Let's move on now to First Solar. Uh, and this one is a very interesting business. It is an American business and also a capitalizing on where the world is going. Yes, yes. So um, I like First Solar because 
It's a leader in American solar tech, and uh, it's actually the only U.S. solar company that does not actually need to import any components from China. If you look at its PV modules, it's technologically advanced, providing actually a lower carbon alternative to your traditional uh, PV modules. And overall, we expect to see good prospects in the solar industry in the long term, especially considering the pending interest rate cuts and lower inflationary environment, which will make it financially easier for companies to roll out large scale solar projects. Uh, so definitely expecting to see a lot of value come from this one in the long term. Also, can I just uh, to uh, you know speak about uh, the ability for them to export at some point? It does look like they um, service the American uh, clientele, and that's actually a very big market. There's a lot of Americans, and there's a lot of American households. Uh, but of course, there's potential there for this business uh, to to go global and to expand. Yes, definitely. It actually already has a, a global presence. Now it's understood. It has a presence in India, in Vietnam, in Malaysia. It's got quite a big presence in India at the moment. It's really been focusing its efforts uh, on rolling out more uh, production facilities there and just really targeting that market. Um, but recently, you know, there were some concerns around uh, China and the, the dumping of Chinese solar panels on the U.S. markets. Uh, that is one, uh, you know, headwind that we do need to take account of. So. What we've actually seen is they're saying that uh, in terms of that Inflation Reduction Act that the U.S. introduced, what it does is it provides subsidies to manufacturers of producers of solar panels. It's not intended for Chinese um, suppliers, of course, but they've, they've somehow found a, a, a loophole by uh, manufacturing the final solar units in Southeast Asian countries, which then benefit from that same tariff that... Uh, uh, the, the U.S. is allowing exemptions on. And by doing that, what's actually happening is they're, they're flooding the market at very low pricing points, which then, of course, you know, has the impact of putting the local solar manufacturers under a lot of pressure. So this is definitely something that was raised by First Solar uh, to government. And uh, hopefully it's something that is addressed because it is a headwind for the company. However, we do think that the government will probably act on this and uh, make the necessary revisions. Yes, I um, actually wanted to ask about that, you know, government support for a company like First Solar. We know it's a very big employer within the United States, like you said, all components uh, locally manufactured in that U.S. market and all of it for the U.S. market. Do companies uh, that have that kind of uh, patriotic uh, viewing often then find favor with government? Yes, yes. So they are, like I said, you know, those um, that Inflation Reduction Act that has provided ta tax subsidies and benefits for the, the producers of solar panels, because of course, you know, the government recognizes that it's very important to transition the industry towards more renewable um, energy sources to help us just decarbonize and to reach those climate targets. Uh, with that said, Fahim, I'm keen to get your thoughts on these counters and possibly, uh, you know, ranking them from one to three for any uh, retail investors who might be keen to go in, but are not quite sure in what order they would go in. So uh, I think our first choice is Brynrod. Uh, once we see recovery in Richards Bay and uh, the Durban Ports in Alatanja, I think we'll also see a lot more uh, recovery in the performance uh, from the, the SA side of the business. And um, as we discussed, they're also looking to collaborate with Transnet on the railway line. And if that goes ahead, that will be another leg of growth for the company. So we do see this one going from strength to strength over the next few months. Then the second one that I would recommend is for solar. Uh, expecting to see good performance coming from the solar industry here in the long term. And uh, considering the unique type of PV modules that they supply that is more uh, you know, energy efficient in comparison to the conventional types, we think that uh, you know, they, they will always have a competitive advantage despite imports coming in from other countries like China. And then looking at the valuation, it's trading at quite an attractive forward PE at the moment of 9.9 .9 times. And we're expecting upside of at least 40% on this one. And then finally, I would recommend Standard Bank. Like I said, we of course like that Africa growth story and the diversity of income that comes from Africa. And expect to see recovery in the stock price over the long term once we see a cut in interest rates and uh, a lower inflationary environment. And with that said, our educational term for the week is value risk. Help us unpack what this means. 
Yeah, so value at risk is quite an important uh, risk measure that we use in the investment world, particularly when it comes to portfolio management. So it's basically used to measure the downside risk of a portfolio. There's three components to it. We've got the loss, the size, uh, the probability, and the time frame. So if I just give you a quick example, if I told you there's a 5% probability that a company will experience a loss of 50,000 or more in a, any given month, we would simply say it's the same as saying that there's a monthly 5% value of risk uh, at risk of 50,000 rand. There's a lot of judgment when it comes to, to calculating this metric though, um, but it's quite an important one because it allows you to compare the risks of different portfolios or, or asset classes. And it can also be used to evaluate your returns versus the level of risk taken. And uh, most portfolio managers will make use of value at risk to measure the risk of their portfolios. Brilliant, Fahima. It's always a pleasure having you here on Stock Picks. Thank you so much for chatting to us today. And that was Fahima Dia. She's from Momentum Securities.